1999, I found out that I was pregnant with my second pregnancy. At that point, I had absolutely no reason to believe that there would be any problems whatsoever. After all, I had already had my first daughter. Under circumstances which are all considered the health risk factors that would have complicated my pregnancy. I was poor. I lived in the projects. I had a high school diploma. But despite all of those things that we talk about that are the risk factors concerning our health and well-being, I had a perfectly healthy pregnancy that was nine days past due. Successful breastfeeding, healthy baby. And during that pregnancy, what I also had were the assistance and the help of a grandmother, a great-grandmother who got to see her first great-great-grandchild. My mother, my father, my aunts, my uncles. I had a situation where my pregnancy was not considered abnormal. It was just what we do. So consider, again, going back to my second pregnancy. If everything was fine the first time around, why wouldn't it be the second time? It became very clear and very obvious early on in that pregnancy that that was not the case. First, it started out with having some dizzy spells, some nausea, difficulty keeping food down, then just some food aversion, period. Somewhere around 20, 21 weeks while I was at work, I remember having this feeling of pressure. I looked at my colleague and my mentor at the time, Lucretia Long, and I said to her, Cree, I need to go see the OBGYN. I need you to take me upstairs. At this point, I was working at OSU. I was a nurse. I said, I need to go upstairs. I feel like the baby's trying to come out. So I went upstairs, got to see my OBGYN. Of course, I had access to all of the things that were necessary to be able to have a healthy pregnancy. At that point, I had two doctors. I had a partner. I had this great job at OSU. I had met all of those risk factors, correct? I went through my exam, and I was told, you have an incompetent cervix, which basically means my cervix was dilating and opening way too soon and way too early for the baby. In my head, I was thinking to myself, how could this be happening? I don't understand. And I remember hearing at that point, sometimes we just see this happen with African American women. So what followed next was my doctor told me that I had to go home and take four weeks off of work. I thought to myself, are you kidding me? Because here are all of the other factors that are being considered. I was a sole provider of my home. I worked inside of an institution, with the exception of the very close folks that I worked with in the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program, that continuously put demands on me that felt like they might be a bit disproportionate to my white counterparts. I also had the concerns of what was happening inside of my own home. Because not only did I have the pressures of work and have the pressures of trying to carry this baby and be healthy, but I also had the messaging that was being given to me of what's wrong with you? Why can't you just get it together? Regardless of all of that, I followed the doctor's orders. So you would think at this point, everything's fine, right? Unfortunately, due to a rapid series of events, stress related to work, the continuous messaging of, well, you're just at risk for because. I went in for a doctor's appointment on the morning of March 20th, 2000. I had my colleague and my best friend with me, again, Curry. We did the, our, my exam, and the doctor looked at me and said, we have to take the baby today. I contacted my partner, 
I let him know what was going on. And at 7.17 p.m., at 34 weeks and five days, I was introduced to Jaden Olivia, who you see on screen. It doesn't stop there. Immediately postpartum, Jaden was basically doing everything that she needed to do. She was breathing on her own. She had latched. We were doing well. It was absolutely amazing. It was amazing to me. But because of the protocol inside of the hospital that says if you have a baby that's born before a certain time and they have to be observed in the nursery for at least four hours, the nurse took the baby from my breast while she was eating. They fed her formula, even though I explicitly stated that she was breastfed only. I developed a staph infection that I had caught from the hospital, a nosocomial infection, if you will. And I had significant postpartum depression, issues at home with the concerns or the expression of, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get it together increased? And because I was the sole provider of our home, I returned to work when she was three weeks old. So imagine for a moment what it feels like if you're told that you have reached and accomplished all of the things that eliminate these factors and the only thing that you're left with is Sometimes this just happens more often because you're African American, because I'm black. So when I became pregnant the third time, or at least when I became pregnant with my third daughter, I want you to think about what that actually felt like. See, because I had already had a pregnancy in between after Jaden. And because of the fact that mentally I was still living with the fact that I thought that my body was broken, and because I had a family that I had to support, and all of the other factors that came into play, I chose to terminate that pregnancy. And then I got pregnant again. The running joke at the time was that if I stood in the same room with my husband, I just dropped a positive pregnancy test. So with that, I scheduled my first doctor's appointment with, Jay, with Julian. My first doctor's appointment, within the first five minutes, what he said to me was, well, you know that you're at risk for a preterm baby because you're African American. And at that point, I literally started hearing the Charlie Brown teacher speaking to me. I said, thank you very much. And in my head, I said to myself, you won't get another one of mine. And so I went home and I looked at my husband, I looked him in the eye and I said, listen, I don't care if you're gonna divorce me. I am not going back. I am not having this baby in a hospital. If it makes you feel better, I will go ahead and hire a midwife, but I am not doing what we did the last time. And I have no idea what I looked like, but all he had to say was, okay. <laughs> Julian Rose Calderon was born at home in my bed, eight pounds, 15 ounces. Now, you might ask yourself, what was so different? What was different between those two pregnancies that was so much more similar to the first pregnancy that I had, well, with the exception of the weight? The difference was, was that I made a return to the root. I remember the lessons of my family, of my grandmothers. I remembered that I actually was enough I had a deep belief in myself and started coming into the understanding of the fact that we have done this for as long as there has been time. That we were brought to this country with the knowledge and the understanding of what it is that we needed for ourselves. That at the end of the day, all we needed to do and all I needed to do was listen to me. I knew what was best. As we know, in Franklin County,
we are currently struggling with our black infant mortality rate. While we see the rates decreasing in our white infants and our Hispanic infants, black infants are staying roughly around the same at 15, anywhere between 14.6 and 15.2 per 1,000. Ohio, we have one of the highest rates of black infant mortality in the entire country. We have a black maternal mortality and morbidity rate that doesn't have a standard measure. We have levels of health communication that consistently start with, you are at risk because you're black, or specifically because you're African American. And you remember what we were talking about in regards to the social determinants of health and how those are most often linked to those of us that are in our community. But the reality is, is that research shows, some of my own research, says even when we as black women achieve a bachelor's degree education, address the economic situations, have affordable, stable housing, and our rates still remain anywhere between two to four times higher than our white counterparts. Take it one step further. When you take a white woman with a college education and a black woman with a college education, and you take a look at those health disparity gaps, that health disparity gap actually grows in some ways. And we believe that it's not just because of what are the social determinants of health. It can no longer be the conversation about how it is that it's our bodies that are creating the situation. It can no longer be about our scarcity. What it has everything to do with are the structures that have actually been put in place that have created the social determinants of health. And so even once you remove those social determinants, you still have the same structures and policies that were in place before. That often, in particular, as professional women, put us closer to the source of the institutional racism that impacts us on a daily basis. Often you'll hear now inside of public health and research discussions around epigenetics. A lot of us have heard those stories in regards to cell remembrance, what it is that keeps getting passed down through our 400 year timeline that we have been here in this country. Also research shows as they start to acknowledge that some of these structures and these institutional policies that create these stresses come up. The activities of daily living, of being a black woman in America, of being a black man in America, of being black family in America, increase, our alle increase the pressure on what is called our allostatic load or weathering. It means that our bodies start breaking down simply because the moment we get up in the morning, we have all of the variables that we have to consider. So if we consider all of these issues and all of these variables when it comes to our maternal and infant health in this country, the fact that we have our own scholars, our own researchers, and quite frankly, the validity of being in the lived experience ourselves, who do you think would be the best to go to in order to tell our story is why we created Root. Restoring Our Own Through Transformation is a black woman-led reproductive justice organization dedicated to addressing the needs of our families and our communities. Reproductive justice in and of itself is not just the pro-life or pro-choice argument. It is the autonomy of our bodies and our families to be able to make the decisions that are best for us. It is about the ability to choose how, where, when, and if we are going to create a family and also being guaranteed to be able to have the safety of having that family. Because while it is that we do have one of the highest black infant mortality rates in this country that we do, for most of us, it's not just about making sure that our child gets to the first year. It's about making sure that they don't get shot by a police officer in our neighborhood. And what Root seeks to do is very simple. Listen to black women. 
We're with our women and our families and our communities from the beginning of their pregnancy all the way throughout postpartum. We're there to support, we're there to listen, we're there to advocate, and we're there to be able to act as the liaison. In our preliminary stats, almost every single one of our babies makes it to 40 plus. We have very, very few postpartum complications, and if we do have them, they're minor, and they're very quickly addressed. We have never lost a mother. What you see on this screen is what it is that we do. We seek to change the story and the narrative. And let me be really clear, there's nothing new under the sun. We're not the first to do it. This isn't necessarily innovative. We are one of the first here in central Ohio and in the Midwest to be able to address it in this way, but we have multiple organizations that are like ours either black women or POC-led organizations that have the exact same stats and results that we do. Many of them I have been honored to be able to be trained by and work alongside. And if that's the case, and we know that organizations like ours are shifting the stats to where it is that the rest of the country wants to get to, the call to action is to make sure that you seek out our organizations. Because if we are, again, talking about the levels of institutional racism that happen, it also impacts the visibility of the organizations that are out here that have been doing the work for many, many, many years. And quite frankly, have learned from, and, and from the stories that have been passed down for over 400. We're also very honored to be a part of a national organization called the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. We have the support, the knowledge, the background, and our experiences that tell us we know how to take care of ourselves. That this story surrounding, as coined by my colleague, Dr. Joya Creer Perry, that race is the health risk behavior is absolutely not true. Racism is. This is our story. We are fully capable of being able to take care of ourselves. We are fully capable of being able to have full-term pregnancies. What we need to have is safety, not just safe sleep. If the number one factor for black infant mortality in our country has to do with preterm and low birth weight infants due to stress factors that we know are real and there just by our own voices, but also backed up by the research, then we need to be sure that we're actually putting the resources into the organizations that are willing to do this work. Remember this, if the reality of our lives is that black lives matter, then black families matter, and so do black mamas.